Amen. Uh, Thank you to those who have led us so well in worship. Um, This morning we move into a new sermon series, and are we thankful that we don't have to look directly into the rose window today with the way the sun is coming through that window. As we now uh, turn our attention uh, to the Word of God, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the worship uh, that we have experienced this morning, uh, the worship that we have offered to you this morning. We pray that our worship would continue now through our attentive ears, that we would open up your word with ears to hear. That we would have hearts ready, eager to receive your word to us. Father, I pray that your spirit would lead us to truth. Open eyes, transform hearts. That you would have your way. That your will would be worked in us now. Father, I pray as the one with the task of preaching and that I would not stand in your way, that I would not make muddy what you have made clear. Uh, if any of my words, thoughts uh, slip in, may those fall to the floor. May your words remain. May your words bear fruit in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My thoughts on this morning's topic were were formed by a lunch with a friend many, many years ago. Over the course of lunch, my friend, who was a committed follower of Jesus, um, confessed to me um, his struggle with lust, and I'll leave it there. After he confessed this, after he got everything uh, off of his chest, he said to me, well, I guess we're just sinners, and that's the way that it is. And I, I stopped my friend, and I said, well, I agree, we do sin, But that's not just the way that it is. I expressed to him, you've been called. You've been called to so much more. You've actually been called to Christ-likeness. As we begin this new series titled, The Holy People of Sulphur Springs. I ask the question, are we sinners or are we saints? To help us through this series will be Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I invite you to join me there now. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you're headed that way, can I hear a big loud amen? Amen. I hear Bibles rustling. I'll give us a moment as we find Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians 2, verse 1, and the Word of God says, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, 
We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because... But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, he may show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. You were once dead in sin. You were once dead in sin, gratifying the cravings of your flesh, deserving of God's wrath. But, but God made you alive in Christ Jesus, saved you by grace, created you to do good work. This series will be a study of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and it'll also be a study of salvation and spiritual growth. In the weeks to come, we will dig through Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 in a very thorough manner. But for this morning, we... We begin the discussion asking the question, are we sinners or are we saints? My first point to you this morning, all are sinners. (laughs) The, The word for sin, and we see... Uh, This in both the the, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, and we see this in the Greek word in the New Testament. The the biblical word for sin is a word picture. It's imagery. The, The word for sin describes this image of missing the mark. It's actually a term, a phrase, an image borrowed from archery. Imagine uh, the will of God as the bullseye. And with every thought, word, action, we are called to hit the bullseye of God's will. And every time we we think or or speak or act and we miss the mark, the Bible describes it as sin. So think about this. If you've got that imagery uh, in your brain, every time we think, we we speak, uh, we act, we, we are pulling back the bow and we are shooting the arrow towards the target. And every time we miss the bullseye of God's will, it's sin. Imagine how many arrows you fire in a day. Every thought, every word, every action. Imagine how many arrows you fire in a day. And once you attempt to get your mind around that, imagine how many miss the mark. If you can grasp that, how many arrows 
do fire, not in a day, but in a week. In a month. In a year. In a in a lifetime. The Bible <laughs> would, would say a lot. <laughs> a lot. The preacher in me this morning would say, you don't have a landfill big enough to hold all the mist marked arrows. You don't have a landfill big enough not only to contain all the arrows that missed the mark, you don't have a landfill big enough to contain all the arrows that flat out missed the target altogether. You might be tempted to say, well, that's not that big of a deal, is it? I mean, not that big of a deal. Uh, I mean, I look around and everybody's missing the mark. Everybody sins. And in my opinion, when I look around, a lot of people do it a whole lot more than me. Not that big of a deal. Well, at least not for me. Not of a big of a deal for me. Well, <laughs> Romans 6.23 would say that the wages of sin is death. Just one missed mark deserves death. In just case we miss that, in case we're unable to see our own sin, Romans 3.23 would say all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So, speaking to you, and speaking to the people in front of me uh, and, and the, the people hearing my voice through other methods of, of technology, if you have never embraced the gospel today is the day to do so for the wages of sin is death and all have sinned let's talk about this a bit more my, my first point all are sinners uh, but some are saints like I said moments ago over the course of this series we are going to get our hands dirty digging through Ephesians 2 1 through 10 we will get to the specifics of that passage but, but for this morning as we have this opening discussion I want us to notice how Ephesians begins Ephesians 1 1 the very beginning of the letter, the Apostle Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice, Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, re refers to them as God's holy people. God's holy people. N not sinners. It, it doesn't address the letter to a group, a, a collected group of sinners, but to the church, God's holy people. And, and you know what? If you were to thumb through the pages of your New Testament, this is not unique to the letter 
to the church in Ephesus. If you were to flip through your New Testament letters, you would see this as a common description of the church. Well, let me draw your attention. Um, a letter we call Romans. To, to all in Rome who were loved by God and called to be his holy people. To the letter we know is Corinthians, uh, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. The letter we know is Philippians, to God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. The letter we know is Colossians, to, to God's holy people in Colossae. You could translate this phrase, holy people, as the holy ones. You could translate the phrase as saints. This is why I personally, using the example that we see in the New Testament, address you as the holy people of Sulphur Springs. Let's think about this for a moment. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, who penned the line that the wages of sin is death, the Apostle Paul, who penned the line that all sin and fall short of the glory of God, describes the church as holy. Did he forget the book of Romans? Did he forget the, the sinful actions of those to whom he was writing? No, he's being intentional. The Apostle Paul knows full well that all are sinners, but some, but, but the church is comprised of saints. That needs a bit more explanation as well. My, my third point to you this morning. You are made holy by the completed and sufficient work of Jesus. The church is comprised of those who have been united in Jesus' death and resurrection. Right? That is the church. The church is made up of those who have united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Now, pause for a moment. We do live in an era of the church a bit different from the context of the book of Ephesians. When, when Paul writes the letter to the church in Ephesus, he stands on good ground that that letter is going to be received solely by a collected group of committed followers of Jesus. I stand, you sit, in a bit of a different context. I stand before a collected group of people who have some, there's some here who, who have committed their life to following Jesus Christ. There, there are some here who have embraced the truth and beauty and power of the gospel. And there's some who haven't. There are some going through the spiritual motions. There are some here who have no intention of committing to follow Jesus Christ. We, we've gathered here for various reasons. But when we speak of the church, 
as described in the New Testament, the church is comprised of those who have united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. So the Paul can, can speak with confidence to the church that you've been made holy by the completed and sufficient work of Jesus. We've united with Jesus in his death and resurrection uh, through our profession of faith. And, and as the New Testament describes it, that, that profession of faith is followed by baptism. We had the pleasure of seeing that lived out for us today. Young Ava professing her faith in Jesus Christ, uniting with him in his death and resurrection, and therefore displaying to the world that she has been made holy through the completed and sufficient work of Jesus. We confess our faith. We follow that profession of faith and baptism. And through the ongoing work of the Spirit that indwells us, we are empowered, called, transformed to live an abundant life now as we make our way towards eternal life in heaven. You are holy, speaking to the church those who have made that profession of faith, those who have embraced the gospel, you were made holy by what Jesus has done on your behalf. Uh, you were made holy by your relationship with the Holy One. You need reminded of that. We went through this last week. It's through the incarnation that Jesus, the Son of God, took on flesh. It's through his life that Jesus spoke the words of God and demonstrated the character of God. It's in his death that Jesus provided redemption of sin. It's through his resurrection that Jesus provided victory over sin and death. It's in his exaltation that Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. And it's in his coming, second coming, that Jesus will return to earth as Lord. For the church, you, you are made holy by what Jesus has done on your behalf. You are made holy by your relationship to the Holy One. So get this. God does not look at your thoughts and your words and your actions and declare you to be holy. That would not work out for you. Right? If God were to look at your thoughts and, and actions and, and words and declare judgment, that would not work out well for you. You would not fare well. But because for the church, because of your relationship with the Holy One, God looks at your thoughts, words, and actions and sees a cross where Jesus died for your sin. And God looks at your thoughts and words and actions and sees an empty tomb where Jesus rose from the dead to give you life. That's the good news of the gospel. Through your faith in Jesus, you are made holy. So, the thought is bouncing around in your heart and mind. You want a bit of clarity. You're saying, well, Pastor Jeff, come back to the original question. You want to ask, uh, are we sinners or are we saints? Which is it? Are we sinners or are we saints? My answer, yes. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. For non-Christians, when you sin, 
You are living according to your identity as a sinner. That's the truth. And for the non-Christian, when you sin, you are merely living out your nature as a sinner. But for the Christian, when you sin, you are, you are acting contrary to your identity as a saint. So, for, for the Christian, for the sin in the life of a saint should, should produce repentance and a further embrace of the gospel. And it should produce spiritual growth as you repent of sin find the embrace of a savior and continue to follow after him for the Christian when you sin you act contrary to your identity as a saint for as Ephesians 2 1 through 10 puts it once you were dead in sins. Once you were gratifying the cravings of your flesh. Once you were deserving the wrath of God. But God made you alive in Christ Jesus. But God saved you by grace. But God created you for his good work. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty and the power of the gospel. May we all bow before the power of the gospel now. Some of us are in the habit of bowing before the power of the gospel. Some of us need to do that for the first time now. Father, give us the courage. Give us the strength to say no to the ways of this world and say yes to the eternity-changing truth of a cross and an empty tomb. We pray these things in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen.